This episode of Sewing with Threads is sponsored by Baby Lock. Wherever your embroidery journey takes you, Baby Lock's embroidery machines are here to make it easy every step of the way. Baby Lock's new machines are easier than ever to use and incorporate some of the latest embroidery technology available. Select models include the all new IQ Intuition Positioning app, which enables you to take a photo of your fabric in a special hoop and transfer it wirelessly to the machine. You can position your design exactly where you want it, how you want it, every time. It's embroidery made easy. Visit babylock.com to learn more. Welcome to Sewing with Threads, the monthly podcast by the staff of Threads Magazine. I'm the editor, Sarah McFarland, and I'm joined by... Hi, I'm Carol Frazier, Senior Technical Editor. I'm Janine Clegg, Managing Editor of Production. And our special guest today is Peter Lappin. Welcome, Peter. Thank you for being on Sewing with Threads again. Peter was the first of our digital ambassadors. He writes about sewing techniques, and he shares his extensive knowledge of vintage sewing machines and patterns for our website and Threads Insider membership. His own blog, Mail Pattern Boldness, has attracted a wide audience over the last 10 years. And why not? It's a not-so-serious, stylish chronicle of Peter's sewing adventures. It includes everything from his tips on sewing jeans and shirts to sure bets when f- shopping for fabrics and notions in Manhattan's garment district. And Peter, since you've been on the show before, yes. we have new questions for you. Oh, terrific. I'm thrilled to be here, by the way. Thank you for Thank inviting me It's good to back. have you again. What is the first piece of clothing you ever made? The very first piece of clothing that I made was actually a pair of boxer shorts. Uh, I think that was probably my, my second project. I started out making a, uh, a denim sewing machine cover, but my very first, first garment, garment was, was, uh, boxer shorts. was a pair of men's boxer shorts. Was yeah. it interesting fabric? Uh, it was red gingham. Okay. Yeah. What has been your favorite sewn garment? My favorite sewn garment perhaps is this uh, chore jacket just behind me, which Beautiful is actually... Beautiful poppy print. Yeah, it's, mm-hmm. a, uh, it's a poppy print that's actually... Uh, quilting cotton. It's a, a series done on the based on the Wizard of Oz. So this poppy print was inspired by a Louis Vuitton uh, anorak that I saw in a in the Louis Vuitton store in Manhattan, and in a very similar print, and it was thirty eight hundred dollars. <laughs> and I came home and I thought, wow, let's see, maybe I could make something similar. Uh, originally, I was going to make an anorak, but I actually tend to prefer to wear outer wear that I can button up mm-hmm. all oh, the way yeah. as yeah. opposed to just like a little half zip. So it really came out great and uh, it's fun to wear. I love the colors in it. At Thank a you. fraction of the price. price. At, a, yes. at a fraction Absolutely. of the price. <laughs> what has been your biggest sewing disaster? Well, I like to think that I haven't had too many sewing disasters, <laughs> but I remember when I first started sewing, which is now exactly 10 years ago to the month, Uh, I I thought it would be fun to try to make a notch collar blazer, but I knew absolutely nothing about uh, interfacings. So, for example, instead of using hair canvas, I used vintage percale sheeting, cotton poly sheeting. And it was just, (laughs) it was layer upon layer of stuff, and I had no idea what I was really getting into. Uh, I never wore the jacket out, but uh, it was an experiment. And you completed the project? I, I basically, yes, I did complete the project. That's good. It's not the only project I've ever made that just... Just didn't come out. Just didn't it, come out or just to ended us up all, living in the closet. Mm-hmm. But you probably learned more from that failed project than from some maybe some of your other ones, right? Yeah, I learned a lot. That's good. Is there a technique that you struggle with the most? Um, today, is there a technique I struggle with the most... I would say that I still sometimes struggle with choosing the the correct interfacings for the fabrics that I'm working with. There's such a, particularly when it comes to tailoring wool, there's such a wide range of um, support fabrics available and sometimes you really don't know what's going to work through the life cycle of, of the, the, garment. Of the yes. garment, and it might only be years later that you realize that that interfacing is shrinking. Mm-hmm. You know that you were that you didn't pre-shrink, for example. 
or maybe you pre-shrank the interfacing, but not the fashion fabric. So those are things that just take time to learn. To d- you yeah, may not discover. find them in a book. Yeah. Yeah. And what current fashion trend do you find most inspiring? Well, one of the things I really like seeing is a resurgence of camp collar shirts, like the one that I'm wearing. A camp collar shirt is a shirt, it could be for a man or for a woman, that doesn't have a collar stand. It has a front facing that into which is embedded the, the, the collar. And uh, it, it's a style that you see very often in Aloha shirts, mm-hmm. bowling shirts. A lot of women's blouses are the camp collar style. It's also called a convertible collar. And ah. it's convertible because if you button it up at the top, there's always a little button loop at the top. It looks almost like a dress shirt. It does. And in fact, I'm going to be teaching a, uh, a convertible collar class for Blueprint uh, at the end of this month. Oh, have you have you already filmed it? Did you go to uh, Denver? I'm or? going to Denver last weekend of June. So it, it should debut around the time that this debuts in August. Yes. Oh, congratulations. That'll Thank be you. Fun. I'm very excited and about And that'll be it. interesting because I know there are a lot of ways to deal with the back neckline on a collar like that. And you yes. probably have some favorite yes. ways to get yes. it to look there really great. Yeah. yeah. Okay, we're going to take a brief break and then we'll be back to talk uh, more with Peter about his latest projects. Are you in? Thread's Insider Membership grants you access to project inspiration and the tested sewing methods you need to make gorgeous garments. Find out how to design skirts and tops, fix difficult fitting issues, and work with all kinds of fabrics. To find out more and get insider access, visit threadsmagazine.com. And we're back, and we're talking with Peter Lappin. Uh, he writes the, bol- the blog Mail Pattern Boldness, and I love seeing the things that you're working on, Peter. And you brought some with you today. I did. You did. So um, at the beginning, you talked a little bit about the poppy jacket and That's how right. that was inspired by a Louis Vuitton anorak. And the black and white shirt there, could you tell us more about that? Yes, the black and white shirt, the style of the shirt, is it's called a popover. And this is... You can see it doesn't button all the way down. You pull it over your head, and there's this little uh, half placket in the front. And what I've done is combined three different fabrics. Now, these um, are actually hand-woven by machine uh, cotton fabrics from India, and they're very lightweight. And uh, the pattern itself, which I just happen to have here, is it's a McCall's pattern, from, I would say, roughly 1958, 1959, and uh, it really makes a nice shirt. Now, the pattern itself does not have the color blocking, for lack of a better word. And so what made you decide to go with that, and how did you choose the fabrics? Well, actually, the fabrics chose me in a way. I was approached by um, an online fabric store called Lumen Stars, and they sell these Indian fabrics exclusively, uh, hand-woven, and... Uh, they gave me the opportunity to make something with the fabric and I chose a few that I liked and I thought it would be interesting to combine them. They're slightly different weights but uh, they work well together, I think. And uh, it's a very lightweight summer shirt, of course. They do work well together. I like how you have the different scales there and stripes and sort of the square effect. It, it all works together very well. Yeah, you can see the, the back fabric is like a very, very light lawn or voile. And for the collar, I used the same fabric for the collar and the placket, and I had to interface that very carefully just to give it a little bit more uh, weight. How because, did you find, yeah. uh, I'm sorry, how did you find working or sewing the different weight fabrics together? Did you have to do anything with, special with the seams besides the interfacing that you just yes, talked about? Yes, I did, as a matter of fact. The hem, for example, I finished the way I would finish a, um, a chiffon, a silk chiffon hem, where I press it a quarter of an inch, stitch along the press line, trim what's left that, that up to the, the stitching line, and then fold it again and stitch again. So it's almost like a rolled almost like a rolled hem. It's very, very fragile. Baby, but you yeah, really just a baby, yeah. a baby yeah. hem, exactly. Yeah. But you're, you're trimming mm-hmm. right. with, a, with, right. a, with a pair of shears yes. up to the stitch line. And it's, yeah. th- that comes out very, very precisely. And I think you have, what, six threads 
waiting that tiny little narrow hem yes. so it always yes. looks yes. great. Yes, yes, yes. yes. Nice. yes. It looks very nice. Thank right? you. Yeah. So is our popover shirt something that you see in ready to wear now? It's my, my husband is a big fan of Hawaiian shirts and he wears them only. That's the only thing he wears all summer. And a lot of them are that popover style, which I a few years ago thought I would try to make him some, but I never found a pattern except, you know, the vintage ones. Yeah, it's it's not difficult. I mean, if you have some pattern making skills yeah, to convert, convert a regular, regular shirt collar yeah. at uh, the time, I didn't feel pattern. ready to do that. I think I could do it now. But the yeah. front placket construction is very similar to the sleeve placket mm-hmm. on a men's or, or yeah. women's shirt. It's the same idea. Um, it's not difficult, but it's a little bit more challenging in some ways. You know, you're cutting mm-hmm. directly into your fr- a big slit down the front of your shirt, which some people can find a little, a little scary. overwhelming, yeah. a little scary. Yeah, yeah but the the, yeah. the popover style, I think I think of it as like an Ivy Ivy League style right. shirt, very preppy. Yeah. Yes, I and, used to have one from my dad when I was in college. I think I would wear it all the time, and I yeah. thought that was very preppy. It was a dark green color, awful kind of olive, but I loved it. <laughs> Yeah, you can still find them. I know, yeah. like Brooks Brothers makes them in yeah. seersucker. Yeah. You oh. tend to find them in those traditional yeah. menswear fabrics like madras or seersucker mm-hmm. summer fabrics because it's a it's a summer style, yeah. casual style. Is there any comfort advantage to the popover style? Do you think you know, not having the the placket run the full length of the front? I've not or? figured that out. I don't know that there is. I'm not sure. In fact, I think it's probably worse for somebody who's. Um, maybe built with a bigger midsection, it's kind of, you know, a little harder to get it on. You have to kind yes. of crawl in it instead of pull it around your body. So that might be not ideal, but... Well, perhaps it's an alternative to the golf shirts, you know, the pullover, pullover yes, shirts. That's true. It looks yeah. a little dressier. On the yeah. other hand, it uh, can be a little looser than some mm-hmm. of the knit shirts. So that yeah. might be the attraction. Yeah, I mean, Maybe. I think it's a style that predates knits. So probably yeah. these style shirts would have been made originally in, in woven fabrics. And then when knits became more popular, it transferred over to like the, the classic Lacoste yeah. tennis polo shirt. shirt. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Polo shirt, yeah. yeah. Yeah, everyone, tennis shirt, golf shirt, yes. <laughs> And in just so you know, we have a sewing save coming up and another couple of issues down the line that um, tells you what to do if you make a mistake when you're when you cut that, if you sew the placket wrong, how to fix that so that you can take it off and put it back on again. Oh, great. Yes. Yeah. In case you are worried about making that cut down the front, there are ways to retrieve it if you've made a mistake the first time around. Yeah. I mean, whenever I know that when I'm like clipping corners, yeah. you know, it's it's. Even, I mean, I have some experience, but still, yeah. it it's it can be a little stressful. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Like you have to get it right. I know they yes. say clip to the all the way to the stitching, and you right. always want to stop a few a few threads That's short right. of that because it's very nerve wracking. Yes, it's funny. Well, you know Kenneth Z. King, yes, one of, of our course. contributing editors, and I've seen Kenneth clip things, and he's so fast, and it is right to that stitch. He's right. just so confident about it, and I think that that comes the more and more that you sew. It's also a reason why to, it's important to keep your shears sharpened. Yeah. Like I know that I have one particular pair of shears that, that's especially good at clipping into corners because the tips are very sharp. Mm-hmm. But a dull pair of shears will not do a good job. Yeah. And you brought a beautiful dress, yes. too. Yes. Now, that is a dress I made last summer. It is, I happen to have the pattern here. It was designed by the designer the late Louis Estevez, and it was printed by McCall's, but the McCall's Pattern Company had a tie-in with the Quaker Oats Company. So this was a pattern that you would mail in for. I guess you would send your proof of purchase from your box of Quaker Oats, and you would get a series of different Louis Estevez patterns. You could still find them from time to time on eBay and Etsy. And uh, I actually made it up in a in a fabric that... Is very similar to the fabric that's oh, shown on the pattern polka dot. envelope. Yes. Yeah, black and white polka dot that I got in the garment district. It's ordinary cotton, nothing fancy, but um, oh, it looks great though. Yeah, and it has that bow and that uh, the big collar, and I just thought it's a very nice buckle too. You found the perfect buckle for yeah, the belt. I think, yeah, I think. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, where do you find your patterns? I buy my vintage patterns primarily on eBay and Etsy. I've had people contribute patterns to me. A lot of people mm-hmm. who follow my blog might have more patterns than they know what to do with, and they'll send me some. Uh, I live near a flea market in Chelsea, Manhattan, so I'll find patterns there sometimes. That's about it, yeah. 
Yeah. Do you usually find the patterns are complete? Yes. Oh, good. Yes. With, you know, of course there are those exceptions, but patterns were not cheap in their, in their day before the 99 cent Mm -hmm. patterns at Johan's. And, uh, in my experience, people really uh, held on to the... And took good care of them. Yeah they, yeah, they really did. A lot of them, I find, were never used because, of course, even then people would buy more patterns than they were ever able to sew. So sometimes they, they still have their original factory folds, which is interesting. Um, they're, yeah. they're, they're fun to see. You know, if you've forgotten the one that has markings on it, it says, Barbara, bust, 43, right. waist, yes. 31. Yes. 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 Who's Many Barbara? times I've gotten them yes. and they have notes for the individual. Yeah, yeah. it's fun. I've, I've found patterns that even have fabric swatches in them. Mm-hmm. Oh, uh, yeah. You know, of course, yeah. like the old Vogue Paris original patterns would come with a little oh, yeah. uh, label that you would put directly. Oh, that's right, oh. yeah, yeah. And, and a lot of fabric stores stamped them with the name of the store. Yes, absolutely. And a little note that said no, no returns, I think. Right. You couldn't return a, a pattern, um, cut or not cut. I think you couldn't ever return them back yeah. then. But very often there would be that per, that person's name who yeah. was going to get the garment. And yeah. Can you estimate how many patterns you have now? Oh, I probably have three, 300, 350. How do you store them? I store them in plastic bags in um, in our, my living room. I have like a big credenza with sort of big doors that open up and shelving. I store some of them in that in in those. I've lately gotten some fabric boxes at the container store that have zippers. Oh yeah, mm-hmm. and uh, those fit. You can fit based on the size you buy. On this particular size, you can fit two rows of patterns. <laughs> So you can store a good hundred patterns in those. Definitely. Yeah. I'm always curious how other sewers yeah. store and organize their patterns. Yeah. I just lately reorganized mine into garment type. Do you do that too? No, I, I usually go by decade. Well, I have ah. I have many women's patterns, so I kept keep those separate. And then I have a box that's nothing but Vogue patterns because I happen to have a lot of Vogue patterns. But those are only the women's. And uh, the more valuable ones, the couturier, oh, and the, yeah. the, the uh, Paris originals. And then I, 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 I sort them usually by decade. Yeah. What's the oldest pattern you think Gosh, you have? Gosh, yeah, I have, I have a men's shirt pattern from probably the, before, the, before World War I or that era, you know, the Edwardian age. Mm-hmm. I have a women's swimsuit pattern that's also like a kind of Max Sennett bathing beauty with the cap. Wow. You know? have, you, have you sewn those? I, have I you haven't them? sewn those. Yeah. Are those printed? Are they the kind with perforated lines? They're, they're the kind with the perforations, oh. yeah. That predates the, the printing of patterns, yeah. Wow. What, were this, what are seam allowances like from those patterns? You know, it's interesting. Seam allowances, I find, even, even up to the 1940s, varied on, from pattern company to pattern company. Hmm. Uh, it's important to, look, to check because... Yes. Like um, I recently made a vintage pair of men's pajamas using a pattern from the late 1930s, Advance, is was the pattern company, which I believe was the pattern company that J.C. Penney distributed. Mm-hmm. And the seam allowance was half an inch throughout instead of five-eighths of an inch. Now, of course, that's mm-hmm. just an eighth of an inch difference. It but adds still, up, yeah. It does yeah. add up. And, and you brought those, and we'll include photos in the show notes, yeah. but they're, they're off screen great. right now. Yeah. Yeah, there would be little variations. Another variation is that you'll often find uh, a double notch on the front of a sleeve, whereas on, in contemporary it patterns, that double back. notch is always on the back. Yeah. So it's important to check because you don't want the, your sleeve put in backwards. Yes. What are? Oh, I'm sorry, Janine. You were going to say something. I'm, I'm curious. You um, separate the women's patterns and the men's patterns. Do you ever use any techniques that you found in women's patterns for any of the men's clothing that you um, that you make? Because you know you always hear about um, women's patterns having men's wears when men's wear characteristics. But I wonder if you do it the other way at all. If there are any techniques that you found that, or details, garment details. Yeah. Well, for example, fisheye darts are something that you find in many women's patterns. Mm-hmm. And occasionally you'll find them in men's shirt patterns, particularly to narrow the back. So yes, I've, I've seen I, that on my brother's um, shirts because uh, he's, uh, he's a tall, thin guy, and they have this slim fit, and it exactly. will have those yeah. fisheye darts And many men you know, are, are quite broad in the shoulders and slim through mm-hmm. the torso. So the fisheye darts will take in some of that bulk. And that's a technique that, that because I've sewn so many women's patterns that I learned to do well. 
but uh, it's it's something that I it may not come directly from women's patterns, but it's something that you'll find much more frequently there, because mm-hmm. women are naturally more curvaceous than most men. Right. Yeah, I think the baby hem that you applied to your shirts probably that's much another more great typical example. of women's wear too. Right. Yeah, and that's something that I that was not in the instructions. It was it was something that I felt was needed given the delicacy of the fabric itself. So how often do you, um, when you're using a vintage pattern, do you try to follow the instructions or do you kind of take off in the direction you like? More the latter, yeah. just because I've I've sewn similar shirts right. so many yeah. times. But I, I will refer to the patterns, to mm-hmm. the pattern instructions. Very often they're, they were written in a very dense format, a lot of words, usually just a single page. It can be hard to figure out, you know, they, 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 the people who wrote those instructions were writing f- for a more experienced sewer. It was assumed that the sewer knew how to make a flat felled seam, how to uh, set in a notch collar. So things, the steps tended not to be as uh, detailed. Are there many illustrations? There are illustrations. Sometimes they look like old comic books. You know, <laughs> there's, a, there's a lot of detail, and we could look at some of those instructions too because they're fun to see. But whereas contemporary patterns tend to take up a lot more paper, there's a lot more white yes. space. They're just easier to read, and there's a little bit more hand holding, which I think is important. It's. I think that that runs the gamut of fiber arts books from that period. You know, when I look at um, vintage uh, knitting books, it's it's basically the design. They don't include instructions um, in detail. Right. Just this assumption that everybody who was looking at it right. had experience. Right. Yeah. In fact, in contemporary patterns, sometimes you'll find pattern pieces only for the interfacing, even though the interfacing is a mirror image of the pattern piece itself, just mm-hmm. simply not to confuse people. Right. Or there'll be a pattern piece for this, the little strip of bias that you need to create a button loop. Right. Just oh, so that, yes. whereas oh, yeah. an old pattern would just say, cut a piece of bias two inches by one inch, you know, and you're on your own. Right. right. Yeah, that's I'm, true. A lot, of, a lot of contemporary patterns will have um, square and rectangular pattern pieces. Right. I know. Yeah. Right. right. I think if you use any of the Berta pattern uh, magazine patterns, you... They, they don't do that. You know, they put no seam allowances, hem allowances. They'll just say uh, trace to here for the interfacing, and then you draft all your own rectangular things. I think right. that was, like, for me, the big jumping off point from having my hand held to, you know, like really figuring it out and understanding what I was doing. Um, and that's, that's a fun thing to do, though. It's good to feel like you have some control over the process. Absolutely. And you're not having to be beholden to the instructions they give you. But I wonder if, um, do you think that, some of the more modern, more contemporary patterns um, avoid some techniques because they're hard to explain. I don't know, maybe the baby hem, for example, or um, some other technique in the sewing that generally is more complicated that you don't see as much um, that you might have seen in more vintage-type garments. Well, I think we live in a time that's much more shortcut-oriented. Mm-hmm. Many home sewers own sergers, so... Uh, a lot of people would, even in, in high, using high-quality fabric, would rather surge their seam allowances than make a true flat felt seam. I've done it myself. Mm-hmm. But, uh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Shortcuts. Yes. <laughs> Quick and easy. Right. Yes. It seems like modern patterns will give you a, as we've been discussing, a detailed way to do it simply when if you know more about sewing techniques, you'd probably choose or could choose a better method. Yeah. 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 I think you took, did you take a class on couture sewing with Kenneth at at FIT? Yes, I've taken three uh, of the couture classes. So one, the first one was sewing techniques. The second Mm -hmm. was specifically embellishments like beading and Mm -hmm. feathers and flower making. And then the third was construction. And do those in any way um, help you with with sewing menswear? Oh, yeah, or, tremendously, yeah. tremendously. Yeah. One of the things I learned most that that I, was really new to me was hand sewing and, and mm-hmm. feeling confident. I had no experience hand sewing, and I, I would go out of my way to avoid any hand sewing whatsoever. <laughs> oh. And one of the things I really learned to appreciate was that uh, sometimes hand sewing actually is the a- answer. It's not cheating, just the opposite. There are certain... Yeah. Uh, uh, results that you'll only 
get mm-hmm. if you sew by hand. So there's a little more control. There's for so sure. much more yes. control. Yeah. Right. yeah. Basting was something that I would never want to do, basting. <laughs> I was going to ask you about that. I've actually timed myself before, and the the time it takes and the aggravation of removing pins, it's it's really just as fast sometimes to hand oh, baste. absolutely. Yeah. I would use, um, you know, all kinds of, I think it's called wonder tape, you know, things to set in oh, zippers yeah. so that yeah. I, I wouldn't have to baste. And I could have basted in the time. And, you know, the, the tapes, would they were double-sided tapes. Very often they wouldn't really work very well or yeah. they wouldn't stick to the fabric. They and, either mm-hmm. don't stick or sometimes they stick where, you know, you don't want yeah. them and to. And it's messy. Yeah. It's all over your hands. Yeah. Or I would yeah. use those, ru- those glue rub sticks. And, it, and uh-huh. you know, it was just if you know how to thread a needle and, uh, and do a simple stitch... It's so much more effective. Yeah. Really? yeah. Now you have a class coming up with Blueprint. Yes. Yes. What is what is the class again? So the class is it's called the Camp Shirt, mm-hmm. and it's going to the Camp Shirt is also known as a convertible collar shirt, mm-hmm. and it's coming up in I think it will be released in August. We're filming at the end of June, and we're making the shirt in a, a beautiful uh, chambray fabric. But I've already nice. made samples in some other fabrics as well. Mm-hmm. It's a very versatile style mm-hmm. because, again, we associate it with bowling shirts, Hawaiian or Aloha shirts. Sure. Will mm-hmm. there be a particular pattern associated with the class? We're or? actually working from a vintage Butterick pattern. Oh, okay. Um, there are so many different convertible collar shirts, shirt patterns out there that we decided that we would let people choose their own and discuss mm-hmm. Uh, the basic, the basic, the construction basics that are uh, through that apply to all of them. Do you have a favorite technique that you're going to share in the class? Well, of course, I'm going to I'm going to show how to use a uh, to make a, a button loop with a loop turner that uh-huh. people oh, find nice. that very, you know, that can be yeah. challenging for them for uh, for everyone. Um, one of the things I like to do, you know, there's a technique for applying fusible interfacing where you sew the inter before you apply it you sew the 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 interfacing that's going to go on the wrong side of a facing mm-hmm. if you can picture oh, this yes and yes. then it you you sew it on first you swing it around and then fuse it so it makes a nice clean seam beautiful we're talking about that, edge. That, yeah. that edge is which yeah. is going to be the inside edge of your uh, shirt facing mm-hmm. Yes. Well, actually, I think that we are getting to, towards the end of our time. And it's funny because we like to close with a, a question from a reader or some kind of sewing tip. And we've all been discussing interfacing <laughs> and problems that we've experienced with interfacing. Fusible so, interfacing. Fusible right? yeah. interfacing. Yes. So, yeah, let's. I mm-hmm. recently had frustration where I just could not get some fusible interfacing to fuse. Um, I used a damp press cloth, I sprayed it with water. Of course, I had the iron set to the correct temperature. It just seemed to take forever. Has anybody ever experienced that? Or do and you what have was any your tips? fabric? My fabric, it was uh, it was a wax print, actually. So it was cotton. It had been washed. But do you think that it being a wax print could have been a factor? I do. I do. Many fabrics that even aren't wax prints have some kind of a finish on them that can um, make the fusible, give the fusible a difficult time. And it, it just depends on the fabric and the fusible. Sometimes it's a bad match, which is why it's always a good idea to to make to some test. samples first and test and see what does this is this a fusible that's going to work with moisture more effectively. Many fusibles are only dry. Yes, um, I always ask for that plastic sheet at that's rolled up in the pellon at Joann's or wherever you buy your interfacing. And I always take note and look at that carefully, make sure, um, you know, whether or not my interfacing needs to be pre-shrunk. And I always follow the instructions. It just seems like it's taking more time and more heat from the iron than I expect sometimes. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Now, I pre-shrink my fusibles. I, I, I read this somewhere online. It's worked for me. I, I soak it in tepid water for maybe half hour and then I just hang it up to dry because I would find that the, the you know, I'd, I'd be thinking so much about shrinking the fabric and not mm-hmm. realizing that the interfacing itself can shrink away from the fabric and that's something that can contribute to the bubbling that we've talked about. 
Yeah, and I think some fusibles don't need to be pre-shrunk, but I don't know how you tell the difference. So it's probably safe to, to just pre-shrink them all. Or um, I know that we have another author who uh, just places it down and sort of hovers the steam over it and lets it contract as much as it needs to and then fuses it into place mm-hmm. so that you never fuse it in and then have it shrink the fabric up and yeah, there, there give are, you some bubbles. Like, uh, is it fashion sewing supply? Yeah, that, that, yes. who, yeah that's right. yes. who, that sell very high quality interfacing, mm-hmm. all of which come with inst- with very specific instructions. Mm-hmm. Um, whether those will work 100% of the time, I can't say, because again, there are so many mm-hmm. variables like the fabric, your iron. Mm-hmm. Home irons don't get as hot as industrial irons do. So they don't. And I've started to wonder about my home iron, which I've had for years. And this recent experience, I don't think it's getting as hot as it used to. Yeah. Like in the old days, you know, people would scorch their fabric. I cannot. I have never scorched (laughs) fabric. And it's not for not pressing enough. It's just that the iron doesn't get as hot. Well, you didn't put it down and go get yourself a cup of coffee, then come back. That's the problem. Yeah, exactly. Well, I know the irons we use at Fashion Institute of Technology, you can... I mean, they are. Oh, the steam generator ones? Yeah, yeah. 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 Those are warm. super hot. Yeah. That's, that's fun. It's like the wrinkles just melt away. Yeah. It's very different. And so different. does your garment. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, um, I actually looked up a couple of things online about this interfacing question um, just to sort of see if people had suggestions. And there were some interesting ones that I've never tried, so I'm not going to necessarily promote them, but you could always try them. One of them was instead of using a press cloth, dampen a little bit and use a sheet of aluminum foil that somehow that will on, top, it, of on top of the fabric and iron through it, and that should somehow make it hotter. I don't know if that's true, but it certainly won't stick. Nothing will stick to that. So that's one thing. Another one was after you've, after you've fused it on, leave it to cool completely. Do not touch it till it's completely done so that it has a chance to really solidify and really bond well before you, before you disrupt the layers. I that think one that's makes a, sense to yes, me. Yes, yeah. I think that's yeah. a very good I know that I've, I've heard that referred to as like curing. Yeah. Yes. And yeah. then once it once it sort of has has rested for mm-hmm. a while, to then uh, you can iron it with steam on the on right the other side. side. Yeah, yes. to smooth it out. That seems smart to me. Yes. Then there was somebody else who suggested, and I think this might depend on what you're using for a product, first try fusing with a dry iron and after that steam it. But I know that a bunch that I've got ask for steam in the fusing process. So yes. I think it would I think it would depend and you'd really want to know what the manufacturer suggests with something like that. Yeah. I think it's really trial and error. Yeah. You know? I think yeah, that's it. so it's all about making the samples and Yeah. Read the instructions and make a sample. I know. Right. Every every podcast ends up with and make a sample. No, I'll, I'll tell you this. It's true. This is the primary reason why I hand wash almost everything, not pants, but shirts, Mm -hmm. I will wash by hand because there's less of a chance that the fusible will come off. Mm -hmm. And it's good for your, you know, your, your, your home sewn things will last longer if you wash them by hand anyway. Yes. And dry, of course, air dry. Well, in this day and age though, I think people don't have a lot of time. And so hand washing is difficult. However, on, on your washing machine, there are cycles, gentle cycles, and yes. that works similarly to hand washing. Yes, so. and more people have front loading of yes. washing yes. machines than the, without the agitator. Right. right. Yep. And that seems to be better too for the clothing. That's right. Absolutely. Yeah. That's true. Yes. And make samples. <laughs> make samples. <laughs> make samples. <laughs> That's going to be our our, our, our hashtag mantra. now. Yeah. Hashtag yeah. make samples. Yeah. <laughs> Well, thank you so much for watching and listening. (laughs) You can follow Threads on social media and visit threadsmagazine.com to view show notes for this episode, including more pictures of Peter's garments and the patterns that he used. While you're on the site, please check out Threads Insider, our online membership with exclusive access to expert sewing techniques. Until next time, keep on sewing with Threads. (music) 